Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to this joint meeting uh, with the House and Senate. I want to certainly uh, uh, welcome uh, all the uh, people from rural Vermont uh, to uh, in NOFA to, that's on the call. Um, and um, we had a good meeting, what, maybe a month or so ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that was, uh, went very well and, and was helpful. Um, I think maybe before we start uh, officially, uh, I'd like to have run through the members um, that are with us uh, to introduce themselves. Um, so anyways, I'm Bobby Starr and I chair the Senate committee and our committees will, members will introduce themselves. I'm Chris Pearson, uh, Senator from Chittenden County. Hi, I'm Anthony Polina, in Washington County. Brian Collimore, Senator from Rutland County. Corey Parent, Senator from Franklin County. And would the House members like to introduce themselves? And I think you should have it figured out in what order so you can run <laughs> through it fairly quickly. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, uh, and I'm sorry I was a few minutes late. I'm trying to deal with an issue that's going to be on the floor tomorrow. So uh, I'm Representative Carolyn Partridge. I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of North Westminster, all of Rockingham, and my hometown of Wyndham. And uh, our vice chair is Rodney. So Rodney, why don't you start and then we'll go to uh, Tom and Terry and et cetera. Where's Rodney? <laughs> All right, let's go to Tom, who is our ranking member. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, representative Tom Bach. I represent the towns of Chester, Andover, Baltimore and part of North Springfield. Okay, Terry. Uh, Representative Terry Norris, I represent Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whiting. Uh, Vicki? Good morning. I'm Representative Vicki Strong. I live in Albany and represent Albany, Barton, Craftsbury, Glover, Greensboro, Sheffield, and Wheelock. John? Good morning, everybody. I'm John O'Brien. I represent Royalton and my hometown of Tunbridge. Heather? Good morning, I'm Heather Supernan. I represent Barnard, Pomfret, Queechy, and West Hartford. And Henry. Henry? No. Henry might be in the barn. <laughs> so, Go ahead. Anyway, um, thank you. Uh, thank you all. And uh, the uh, I think I, I should announce uh, before we get started. Um, the Senate committee did vote out uh, the raw milk bill this morning. Um, so I think some of you folks have uh, been supporting that and promoting it. And um, so we voted that out, um, you know, with a good solid vote this morning. And hopefully, uh, by the end of the week, it'll It'll be up for action on the Senate floor and and uh, <clears throat> made just um, a couple of very minor uh, changes to the bill. So um, that, um, you know, is sort of good news for everybody. And uh, and we'll um, we'll be doing other House bills. Uh, at the, the rest of this week and next week and try to wrap uh, our bills up because we, um, for your information, we're planning on uh, getting done the second week in May and the last week or two or for conference committees. And, and so it's important that we, that we move forward with our bills in both committees to, um, to get them uh, past and and hopefully make Vermont a better place to live and work and and do business. Um, so this morning, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Maddie and Caroline to uh, 
kick off with a couple of uh, statements, brief statements, and then we'll uh, get right into a discussion. So I don't know, Maddie, if you're going to go first or Caroline, but I'm sure you've got it figured out. I think Caroline's going to kick us off. Thank you so much, Senator. Oh yeah, thank, thank you all. And uh, welcome to our last small farm advocacy day uh, here in the uh, virtual arena. Um, this is the last of a six part event series where we um, partnered with Nova Vermont and Action Circles on first the virtual advocacy training followed by this today last meet and greet with legislators. And of course, we're extremely grateful for all the legislators of both act committees making the time to um, meet with us here today in a rather informal way, because um, what this is, is really an open forum to give uh, farmers in the state uh, an opportunity to bring concerns that are you know, um, closest to their hearts and, and businesses uh, to, to, the, to the committee's attention, whether they're inside or outside of the, um, our respective organizations' uh, priorities for this session. You will see there will be quite significant overlap, but it is, it is an open forum and, 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 you know, attendees are free to speak what, to, what, to what's on their minds. Um, yeah, I think everybody knows sort of the Zoom spiel, just keep yourself mooted on, on, until it's your turn. And um, uh, other than that, I'll pass it on to, to Maddie to greet everyone as well. Thanks, thanks for everyone coming. And especially, of course, um, also given the unusual heat of our spring weather here, it's also really not, um, uh, we don't take it for granted that farmers make time come to this event because uh, everything is uh, in, in full speed approaching the summer. So um, also from my perspective, thanks, thanks all the farmers to come today. Thank you, Caroline. Maddie? Yeah, thank you so much, Caroline. And thank you um, to all of the members of the House and Senate Ag Committees for having us. We really appreciate uh, you making this a joint hearing so that our farmer testimony can be heard um, by all of you at once. It's really really hugely beneficial. And uh, I just want to say to tack on to what Caroline said, you know, I think um, taken individually, I, I know you all understand this, these farmers testimony might represent, you know, a particular issue or a particular type of farm um, that in and of itself may seem small, but it's just so I, I love these events because it's such a great reminder that these farms really make up, you know, the totality of a thriving working landscape. And so just want to encourage you, you know, as you listen to farmers testify on particular issues to just always keep that in mind, as I know you do, um, that these issues taken together really have a huge impact on farmers' ability to thrive in Vermont and, um, you know, Vermonters' ability to access locally produced food. So just want to say that and really appreciate also all the farmers making time to be here on a beautiful day. Thanks for having us. Yeah, uh, Matt, um, I, I can't see everyone's hand that goes up. Uh, I've got, um, I guess, 12 or 16 of you on, uh, on uh, one page, but then I have to flip pages, but um, who would, um, who would like to lead off with, with this open forum uh, this morning? Senator, any, if you want to go, any hands? Uh, Senator, if you want to go, just an order of the uh, sort of the agenda that's online, and just kick us off with the Union Brook Farm. Um, I don't have that list in front of me. Uh, so who's the first one, Caroline? That would be Rose and Emily. Yeah. Uh, are you there, uh, Rose? Oh, there you are. Hey, I see you up in the good corner. morning. Um, yeah, morning. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you from, for hearing from us today. Uh, my name is Rose, and this is my partner, Emily Verzi. And together we own and operate Unionbrook Farm in Northfield, Vermont. Um, we're here today to advocate for the expansion of the eligibility criteria, criteria for new businesses to be able to access the Working Lands Initiative to include construction costs of new meat processing facilities. 
Um, and we'd also like to advocate for the expansion of the on-farm slaughter exemption to allow for animals to be able to be sold as a whole or half animal but allow for the farmer to be able to butcher those halves or holes into individual cuts for the consumer. Um, this upcoming season will be our second in production and we'll be raising and processing on farm 1000 meat chickens and ducks. We currently sell this product as uninspected under state exemption and offer it for purchase directly at our farm or at the Capital City's farmer's market as a whole frozen chicken or duck. Uh, Emily and I have been raising and harvesting meat birds every summer since we met working at Maple Wind Farm in 2015. Raising meat birds on pasture and having them on um, and having them harvested on farm is a paramount value for our personal meat consumption and our business operation. On farm slaughter decreases the stress of the animal on the day of harvest and increases our profit margins for the enterprise. Um, we are currently limited in our sales avenues for uninspected meat birds harvested on farm because they cannot be broken down into further cuts or sold retail. Um, we will also be utilizing on farm slaughter for our lambs that will be sold directly to customers who purchase the entire animal for a flat rate. Um, so since starting our business in 2019, we have met weekly with a business advisor thanks to services provided by the Intervale Center. And this winter we participated in the Farm Beginnings course through NOFA Vermont, where we were provided with tools for decision-making and a mentor to learn from. And through these processes of an, analyzing our first season, planning for our second season and projecting our business to br bring us to a place where Emily and I can be supported as full-time employees, we have decided to embark on investing in a multi-use building on our property. And this building will allow us to move towards state inspected poultry processing, as well as state inspected butchery of pork, lamb, and goat. Uh, this building would allow us to scale our meat bird operation and offer safe, humane, and value added processing to other homestead and farms in the area. Securing funding for this building has proved to be a barrier for us as I've reached out to the Farm Service Agency and the Vermont Community Loan Fund. As a new business without at least three years of actuals and not enough collateral in the business, it will be very difficult for us to get an affordable loan for this project. And despite being a new business, we collectively have 15 years of farming and processing experience and both have off-farm jobs in the industry. Um, Emily has been the po pork program manager at the Von Trapp Farmstead for five years, managing everything from piglet sourcing to meat sales and distribution. And I have worked for the last two years at Babette's Table, making USDA inspected value-added products like salami and whole muscle charcuterie, as well as providing co-packing services for, to local farms for sausage. Um, currently, the Working Lands Initiative does not allow funds to be accessed for construction costs, despite this project being in line with its goals. I personally believe that the bottleneck in slaughter and processing that the state is facing would be alleviated faster if new businesses had the opportunity to access grant funding for new facilities instead of having to operate at a smaller scale and under exemption for longer than necessary. As a new business, it would be advantageous for us to be able to first access grant funding to get the project off of the ground and then seek out further funding through an FSA microloan program, et cetera, to improve marketing, invest in new machinery, or help to cover operating costs as we scale. So that's all from us today. Thank you so much to Rural Vermont for organizing the advocacy around these very important issues <laughs> and to the members of the House and Senate Ag Committees for hearing from us today. We really appreciate it. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, did Emily have anything to add or? No, we, we wrote the statement together. <laughs> if you guys have questions <laughs> at the end, I'm here to help answer any questions that you guys might have. Yeah. Uh, well, very good. Um, <clears throat> on, I don't know if the House has done it yet, but on the slaughter issue, uh, we, yes, I think the House has voted and passed uh, the bill. We, we did an early um, budget bill, um, and there was extra money put in that to uh, push the um, slaughter uh, slaughtering and the processing um, issue forward starting earlier uh, to set up a, a training program to help 
people in the processing and learning the processing business, as well as um, helping slaughterhouses get started um, in uh, with refrigeration, additional refrigeration and uh, expanding their slaughter uh, facilities if necessary to handle uh, more animals and to get that out. Um, the loan issue that you brought up, uh, I don't know about grants other than what we give to working lands, but I guess you didn't fit into that category, but I'm wondering if you checked with ACCD uh, if they had any type of uh, grants and FSA as well uh, to help you with your with your uh, building project. But those are a couple of areas that you could look at. Um, so um, who's up next, um, uh, Maddie or or Caroline? Yeah, next would be Sean. Hi. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak and thanks to the committee for taking testimony on these important issues. Really appreciate it and fortunate to be a Vermonter and have compassionate people lend an ear. Uh, in the limited time that I have, um, I wanted to focus on this great opportunity um, I see as Vermonters to empower small farmers, provide rural economic development, and strengthen the Vermont brand as we roll out our recreational, recreational cannabis framework. Um, I believe this committee can accomplish these goals um, in two steps. I think one, by allowing farm direct sales of safe lab verified place of origin agricultural goods. And I think two, second step would be allowing the craft cannabis market to meet the demand rather than licensing large growth facilities. Uh, quick background, um, my wife, my two daughters and I are Kismet Farm. We're a small diversified farm offering organic craft hemp flour and as well as cut flowers out here in beautiful rural Rochester. We currently sell our goods locally at farmers markets, CSAs, and weddings. Um, as we transition to recreational cannabis, we see ourselves continuing to sell our high quality craft cannabis to our local community, both in a safe and secure manner. We value our customer safety and currently test all of our products for cannabinoid levels, as well as mold, insects, and heavy metals. We see the same procedure occurring with all craft cannabis producers as we, as we must have customer safety be our highest priority. We Kismet Farm see ourselves continuing the tradition of Vermont farmers and crafters providing high quality commodities directly to our customers. We already have Massachusetts online and New York is next, two neighboring states that will offer recreational cannabis on a large scale. How does Vermont cannabis stand out? I think simply, simple, by continuing the tradition of high quality, small craftsmanship and not providing the inferior mass produced goods that tourists can find in their home states. Um, we see our farm as well as other craft producers being destinations where customers can come to experience the natural beauty of the area and taste the terroir of their lands. As a result of this, we see our local communities benefiting from this agro-tourism. Local shops, restaurants, gas stations, et cetera, will all benefit. Um, as we see the continuing centralization of funding going to bigger towns in Vermont, uh, Act 46, school consolidations, lack of cellular and broadband access, et cetera, I think we have a great opportunity now to empower small towns, the backbone of the Vermont, Vermont tourism industry. I know here in Rochester, we struggle to fund our schools and would certainly welcome the added tax revenue and job creation. <coughs> a few, few more points, I know our time is precious. I know Vermont is smart. Um, we do have models in front of us to use. I feel like Oregon had the right model when they allowed unlimited craft licenses. 
The problem now with hindsight is we know that they did not limit the size of those grows. And as a result, the market moved to mega grows and it, and it, well, now we're seeing a rebound with craft small farms, but small farms were not, were pretty much, you know, low balled out of that market. Um, I think if we allow Vermont craft growers to, the, to meet the demand of the state and not rush to licensing large facilities, we've so far through this whole thing, we have been slow. This whole recreational cannabis process has been slow. I don't think we now rush into this because dispensary lobbyists think they have this all figured out. Personally, I have worked at these facilities and know firsthand that quality and customer, customer health is not the priority. These large grows re require large investments, which disenfranchises small farmers. And I think that limiting the size, keeping quality high, empowering small farmers, and keeping the Vermont brand strong is how we move forward in recreational cannabis. I greatly appreciate your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Sean. Uh, Chris, did you want to have any comments on this? No, but I know we as a committee have talked uh, a great deal about keeping this small and, and uh, the cannabis growers, um, uh, we, um, it's got a long ways to go. I think, you know, we haven't done a whole lot with that. It's been dealt with in the judiciary committees and in uh, not in the ag committee, but um, we uh, have weighed in and do support, uh, you know, certainly support our small, small growers. Um, so <clears throat> any committee members have any questions of Sean? If not, uh, who's, who's up next? And that would be Chris. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Chris White. I own uh, and operate West Crescent Farm out of West Brookfield, and we're a cannabis farm. Um, I have definitely like policy suggestions and things like that. But since this is more of an open dialogue, I think I'd just like to talk about the two types of economic development um, that I see in the state. Uh, one being not very, like not a good look for Vermont and then the other being quintessentially Vermont. Um, and I'd like to ask what these two types of economic development uh, really measure. Um, so the first is top-down economic development. Um, an example of that could look like Mira Weinberger, the mayor of Burlington, taking large donations um, and like from Netty Real Estate and building luxury condos in Burlington in the middle of a housing crisis and, and, and you know, scheduling uh, retail environments underneath those, which only corporations like Starbucks or Chick-fil-A could, could afford to even rent and get in there, especially after a pandemic when people like me and small farmers don't really have money to create that the kind of experiential environment, at least uh, that people will come to Vermont for uh, in cannabis. Um, and, and then we have, you know, like Phil Scott allotting half a million dollars to just give away to, to people to work on their laptops and buy those luxury condos and just kind of stay in that environment. Um, and that doesn't really, what that measures, I think, is, is more just like numbers within the context of like one apartment complex. Um, and then politicians uh, can, can point to it and say, like, it's on paper, it's economic development. Meanwhile, nobody else sees any benefit from that. Um, and the people like my friends who are here looking to buy houses because they're inspired by farms like the ones that we're talking about, um, they just drive right by those, those, those sorts of economic development activities because they look exactly like Boston or New York. There's nothing different about that. And, you know, why do people come to Vermont if not to experience something different? So let's definitely stay true to our, our Vermont uh, identity as we continue to develop, you know, our economy. Um, the second type of economic development uh, is just ground up economic development, um, which is taking place on cannabis farms and small farms all over the state, bringing people to the state, bringing young people to the state. Um, and while the full potential of that economic development is not being measured on paper yet, um, the more important ancillary value that's kind of gone missing in America and, and in Vermont um, values like community, purpose, happiness, hard work, 
um, the things that like make life worth living, not measured by a GDP, um, are just being squandered uh, by the former type of development. Um, so I think when we talk about at least cannabis legislation, labeling it with like a conservative or a liberal bent, like is this conservative or is it liberal? I think that defeats the point because what we need really is just smart economic policy based on what's happening now, just in Vermont. Like forget about California, Massachusetts, Vermont is its own beast. And, and I think we need to respect that and just look at what's happening and, and let the people with the experience lead the way. And I think this meeting is, is an example of that. Although cannabis being controlled by the judiciary committee, you know, I won't get into that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the state talks a big game about needing more young people and it's happening though. We're not really getting the support we need. Um, and I think, you know, sort of to finish with a sentiment. Uh, if this is a revolutionary time, which I think it is, we have, you know, people coming into these committee meetings talking about blockchain economic modalities and how to uh, use that to account for quality in, on all of our farms. These are revolutionary times. And in these times, we need to let the people with the experience uh, lead the way um, because I don't have any evidence that anyone in a leadership position has any experience with cannabis. And that's not anyone's fault. It's just that it's been illegal for so long. No one could have had any experience other than just being brainwashed uh, by, by the ad council. Um, so yeah, in matters of culture, swim with the current because it's just gonna go that way and that's life. And if you're swimming against the current, you're just gonna feel you know tired um, and unfree. And uh, we don't want that for you either. So just maybe swim with the current, listen to the people who are doing the work and let um, happiness and community and all these things that Vermont wants from its youth um, just let them be byproducts of really smart policy. Don't try to write them into policy because we're already doing it. It's already happening. We just need to, we just need to be lifted up. So um, if anyone has any specific questions on what a cannabis farmer like myself, entrepreneur would like to see um, as far as policy in cannabis, I'd love to talk to you individually, but I don't want to take up any time uh, with that. Just the broad sentiment of maybe, you know, swim with the current on this one because we have an excellent opportunity. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Uh, any questions from anyone on to Chris? If not, uh, who's up uh, next? Yeah, next on our agenda is um, a young woman that I don't think has made it to the meeting. Um, so I would suggest since we are um, chugging along with with quite some significant speed here through our agenda. And we have quite some time. If it's okay, I wanted to ask the committees um, if there's um, the, the testimony that um, Rose just gave for Union Brook Farm um, in reference to the Working Land Enterprise Funds and the question of whether these funds that are earmarked for expanding uh, processing capacity for livestock, whether um, there was a question from the from the ladies of Union Brook Farm whether that money is potentially um, eligible for constructing new um, a new business a new slaughterhouse facility. And I was wondering whether the committees um, have an answer um, to that lingering question. Um, if we could go back to that for a second before we move on. Yeah, um, I don't. Uh, <clears throat> I know uh, we put. Um, uh, not a, there wasn't a ton of money in the early bill for the uh, slaughter and um, processing, but it was, do you remember, Carolyn, how much money we put in there? Was it um, to get them started on between now and July 1st? Was it? I, I think, Bobby. Um... Did you earmark five hundred thousand dollars for that? I I uh, believe that was we started at three and then bumped it to five hundred thousand, right? Uh, to get get them started uh, between now and July one, but um, we but but you also had language you didn't you didn't necessarily limit it to five hundred thousand. You said 
you know, at least I think that five hundred dollars, five hundred thousand would be earmarked for it. But I think the total was what three million. And um, so uh, when I consulted Allison Eastman at the Agency of Agriculture, she said, "Well, that you know, we could spend more if we wanted to." So yeah, and that that may climb, but yeah, you know, three million is you know it's a pretty good hunk of change, but there there are hundreds of millions that we've gotten received from the or will be receiving from the federal government that's going to get handed out um i i chris did you have something you wanted to throw in there well if memory serves we're also being told that there's five or six new slaughter facilities coming online so you know we we were digging around about how to make investments to help with the backlog and and it does seem that people are in the process of of bringing new facilities online. So now we're, we've shifted a little bit to the processor as opposed to the slaughter backlog, but um, to the extent that information helps, um, we were pleased to hear it, obviously. And I believe the uh, processing training would be done at uh, VTC uh, with the help of a couple of slaughterhouses <clears throat> in Royalton and <clears throat> maybe Royalton, South Royalton and Bethel or in that area, uh, there's a, uh, some slaughter facilities there that could offer uh, some people to go to VTC to train uh, young or other people to do uh, cutting and, and processing. Um, in the, uh, capital uh, budget to help with buildings. Um, we, we haven't really talked a lot about that, but working lands, I mean, we, we, put, we put a lot of both the House and the Senate, put a lot of money into that process. Um, I think what we would have to do is talk with with somebody from the agency to see if there's any room uh, to add structures to that to that particular uh, granting uh, process, but I I'm sure that there's a a post and beam timber uh, outfit that got money from got money from working lands and. I thought they constructed a new building just just north of Montpelier, um, right there, almost in the city, uh, on uh, a post and beam building that they're working out of. But I, uh, so I don't really know if if you can use money for building or or not. But I don't doubt. Uh, Rose, I don't doubt your word at all if they told you that. Have, have you applied, Rose, uh, for, for uh, working, a uh, working lands grant for your building? Um, well, we haven't yet. I first spoke with, and I guess to your point too, I think, I think training is really important and um, the, um, class that's offered through Vermont Tech is uh, hosted at the facility that I work at, 151 Warehouse in Waitsfield. And um, this year I, I help facilitate um, all three of the workshops. Um, and so I agree that that's one place, but um, acknowledging too that, um, you know, we need workers to fill um, the bottleneck in processing and slaughter facilities, but also to, um, you know, helping them go off on their own ventures as, as we seek to do. And um, so in my understanding of talking with the FSA and the um, Vermont Community Loan Fund, 
there, there, you know, I, I don't have the exact quote in my mind, but you know, the person that I spoke with from the FSA agreed with me that it would make more sense for us to be able to access a grant to get the building itself constructed. And then as the, you know, because we really just for poultry processing, we really just need a building with dairy board. Um, we have the plucker, we, you know, we have the kill cones, we're able to just begin right away. We really just need a hand washing sink and a concrete floor with dairy board uh, walls and, um, and anyway, it seems to me like the Working Lands Initiative does not include construction loans as far as I've been told. And that once we have a physical building on the premises, we can we can access working land grants for marketing help, for um, you know, a new stuff or machine, um, you know, packaging, et cetera. But until the building is um standing i don't know that there's grant funding accessible to us especially to being a business with only one year of actuals um that's provided been difficult as well um we have an llc formed um but without collateral you know for the business to match the loan amount our house and our property would be used as security, which is not something that I'm interested in at all. Um, so that's kind of where we've left off in our personal experience. And I think it does relate to the larger picture of getting young people into this industry and allowing for new opportunities to uh, get going and begin to address immediately the need of farmers um, and homesteaders to provide local and um, humane slaughter and processing. Um, and what, what kind of numbers are you talking about for your poultry operation, Wells? Yeah, in the future, um, I think we are looking at um, wanting to slaughter and you know, raise and process 5,000 birds of our own. Um, and up to 2,500 birds of other, uh, from other homestead and farmers um, around us. Um, and, and also, I think um, we really like the idea of this building being multi-use. I'm in uh, const, you know, daily communication with all the state and federal inspectors. Um, at my day job and um, also am able to ask them a lot of questions about this endeavor that we're seeking to do. And um, the idea is as well that with this building, it would allow for us to achieve state inspection, but it's not to be said that we couldn't have, you know, we couldn't pull it state inspection for three days and do custom processing for two. Um, um, so we're also really interested in the idea of providing custom processing for farmers who don't want to pay, um, you know, have a, have a structured pay scale for halves, quarters, um, you know, individual cuts or value added, um, down the line. So, um, yeah. Um, and how big, how big a building are the costs? and the cost of the building is projected to be what? Yeah, um, so we are looking at a 30 by 70 building on our property. Um, and we currently have an old corn crib foundation on our property that's that size and needs to get removed. Um, and so we are um, estimating right now that the building for removal of the current slab and you know pouring a new foundation will will I your pros uh, Rose. So Vermont, I know he has um, received grants to help. Maybe if you could turn your camera off, Rose. It certainly proves that we need to do a better job oh, with this. So Amen. 
Um, and Bobby, while, while Rose is trying to unfreeze, I don't know if you can see hands and stuff. Uh, John um, O'Brien has his hand up. Yeah, go ahead, John. Well, Rose is unfrozen now, I think. Well, uh, Rose, we heard it's a 30 by 70 building that you're thinking about constructing, and then you froze up to us, and uh, I didn't hear too much beyond that. What was the estimated cost? I, can you hear me, Rose? I, She's muted. Um, maybe well, maybe she could turn her camera off. That maybe that would help. I don't. I think there. Yeah. Can you hear us now, Rose? I think we lost her. Well, yeah. uh, why don't we switch to John with your question, John? Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. While we're talking about bottlenecks and meat processing and, and the internet. Um, I just had a question about, uh, for, for Chris and Sean about what they see as the bottlenecks in the coming bottlenecks in the craft cannabis market and whether working lands grants, for example, are even gonna be available to craft cannabis farmers or you know, potentially because of federal legal snarls, whether that's something the agency might stay away from. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to field that one, John. Um, also a big fan of your work. Um, uh, I think the, the biggest snag is going to come down to access and how it's access right now. It seems like the state is setting up, um, a dispensary environment, not unlike Massachusetts or these states that adopted cannabis many years ago. Um, and I think Vermont did the right thing. They, you know, they did the measure twice, uh, cut once thing, uh, uh, where they look at what the other states do and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and then, uh, try to recreate that in an, in a unique Vermont way. Um, my concern is that, uh, out of state, um, operators with access to debt and liquidity will come in and be able to scoop those places up immediately and create these dispensaries. But dispensaries isolate all that ancillary value that I'm talking about that's not recorded on paper. A lot of the things that people come to Vermont for looking for. Um, and a dispensary, like a darkened window dispensary, uh, doesn't really create access. It just recreates an environment in which uh, cannabis continues to be stigmatized with like security guards and no access to even looking inside. I want to see a place where I could bring my grandmother in to like a general store. And that general store has created a job for a person to operate sort of like a cannabis booth or kiosk out of there. Um, and I think one thing the state could do, which would be progressive, but also I don't think it would really change anything visually in the state is to allow for the incidental purchase of cannabis of already successful businesses, because that allows me as a farmer to create a local relationship to sell cannabis in a place where nationally it doesn't really appear um, like a general store or a cafe. Like think about like Amsterdam. And I'm not even talking about on-site consumption. I don't even think that's a good look for Vermont because people in Vermont are more likely to like stop at a cafe or a general store, buy local cannabis from that county, um, whether they're in state or out of state, and then like take a joint to the river or to their friend's house or to a farm where there's a barbecue happening. So I think if we isolate cannabis and dispensaries in this format, um, we're isolating the value, um, both the value that goes on to paper and the value that's not on paper. And I think right now, um, people are coming to Vermont for that value that's not on paper um, because they recognize it. Like I have two friends from Massachusetts who've been here for three weeks looking for houses because their work has gone remote and they wanna fill their days with things that they find purpose in. So I think that's, you know, Sean, if you wanna take it from there, that's, that would be my policy uh, advice. Yeah, no, just, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Sean. Just to piggyback on what Chris said there, um, you know, he mentioned some fear of out-of-state investment. That's already happened. Out-of-state investors already run our in-state dispensaries. 
So um, if we allow that to continue, I, I just foresee that continuing with this dispensary model that we have in place. Um, I do like also what Chris said about place of origin sales. I do agree there's a value to say maybe not on site consumption, but having the same vineyard model where you can come and experience um, our natural beauty. And again, maybe not consume on site, but to take that experience and place with you um, to share back in their home, home states. Um, another thing I, I think we, we have to realize is there's, there's a big company down in Southern Vermont, the Hempicurian, and very close and on the border of Massachusetts. And they have legal cannabis there and it's not meeting the mark. People are still coming up from Massachusetts asking if when is Vermont going to have sales? Um, the market is there. We just need to produce that craft, small, high-end value that is us, that is Vermont. We are just we can't be what the states around us already are. Um, and that's my take on that. Do you guys, so John, go ahead, John. Oh, just just to follow up on, uh, you see, sort of like what we've just done with raw milk, um, CSAs and farmers markets also being being those places where you can, you know, buy buy a more craft product. Yeah, look, I think like Vermont has such a robust uh, agricultural economy. It's almost like in many respects, like a pre pre capitalist agrarian economy. Uh, where even like in these rural environments, trade happens. So if we can, uh, if we can use, if we can inject cannabis into the current economic modalities we have in Vermont, like CSAs and things like that, um, what we're doing there is allowing like a business owner like myself or Sean to make, we have our sovereign right of choice to make a relationship uh, with a store or a third space, right? Like a retail space, perhaps. Um, we have the uh, sovereign choice to make that relationship um, with a general store or cafe where cannabis doesn't appear anywhere else in the country right now. So I think the smart thing to do would be to look at where California is. They're starting to approach uh, incidental purchases at already successful businesses and just meet them there because uh, you know, like I said, just like swim with the current on this one, because if you can think about cannabis legislation, not in like a two year or a four year like term, if you can think about what is cannabis going to look like in Vermont in like 25 years and then reverse engineer the legislation from there, I think we could skip a lot of this and we could watch what economic development from the ground up really looks like because it's already happening. So and, and the out of state people like Cure Leaf and these other companies are coming in. So yeah, I am super appreciative of this uh, committee, um, even though cannabis isn't really being discussed apparently in the agricultural uh, department of the government, which also frustrating. Um, so rather than approaching it from a position of control, if it's about economic development, approach it from a position of access. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Chris, Senator Pearson. Sure, I, I just wanted to weigh in, not to be too much of a downer, but um, you know, a lot of us have been fighting for tax and regulated adult use cannabis for a lot of years. It, when I was in 2016, I was in the house, the Senate passed it over, um, the house basically wouldn't take it up. The, the, this is, you know, so I, I, what I hear is, is folks interested in, uh, a more perfect model. And I guess what I mean to say is we're lucky to have anything. I mean, it, it was, it was passed against basically a speaker of the house and didn't support it. A governor didn't support it. So it, it's clunky and it has a lot of compromises. Uh, you know, we were forced to accept if we wanted anything, uh, uh, a preemptive vote of approval from a town just to have a store. So, uh, you know, not to say, not to, discourage you from keep continue to ask please do keep asking it's it's the that's how this whole process works but the reality is tricky and 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 not um 
you know, the vision in the legislature is just simply not there in the way you're saying. Then, then we do run into a lot of tough issues. We have a lot of what you asked for that we've empowered the cannabis control board to look at and, and make their own decision about. And I think that's kind of appropriate. It's hard for the legislature to delineate square footage and things like that, but uh, we set out some parameters. Um, and so they will, they will do that. And so bring this conversation to them. That's also appropriate. And, and, but we run into federal limits. We can't say, you know, you only have, you can only give a license to somebody that's lived in Vermont for 10 years, you know? So if people bring outside capital to Vermont, we have tried to pre preference Vermont businesses, but there are legal limits there. Uh, so anyway, just some of the context is, is helpful because, um, I hear people asking for more appropriately. A lot of us have been asking for more, uh, but recognize this is a process that is one where we don't get what we want all the time. And it will evolve. It absolutely will evolve. I, I, I am quite hopeful that after a year, people will realize the sky's not falling and, and you know, it's not rampant, but rather more... Uh, <clears throat> of a, a solid piece of our agricultural economy. So anyway, just some, some thoughts. Yeah, can I, uh, thank Can I Sean? make a comment there? Sorry to interrupt. Um, just to make a comment about the outside investment piece there, um, I think the way, you con the way you combat that is by limiting size. Um, I don't see outside investment being a major issue in Vermont unless we open it up to large grows. I think if it's small, the investment will be small. The, the, if, if we keep canopy size small, that will limit outside investment and we'll just empower craft growers, not large investors. And I think we're likely to do that. I mean, that, that is totally within the framework that the Cannabis Control Board is working under. Thank you. Oh, Senator, sorry, you're muted, and I was wondering if I could just make a follow-up comment before we move on, or I don't know if other folks have questions. Yeah, my phone is ringing, and I tried to shut it down. Uh, did your other witness get back with us, or...? We have, we have two more um, witnesses on the list, but I just wanted to make a follow-up comment on the, the topic of cannabis before we move on. Um, I really appreciate this discussion, first of all, and I just want to say, you know, this is how the legislature will develop more of a vision around cannabis, and I also recognize that you all have been working on this, some of you, for many years, but I think by having people who are really engaged in the industry and or wanting to be engaged in the industry um, in to testify directly, that's the only way that the legislature is going to grow to have more of a vision and more support for a craft industry. Um, so that's why we're here and we are going to, you know, keep showing up in, in your committee and in others because we understand that there is some reticence, um, you know, <clears throat> from the House side maybe or from particular committees or individuals. So that's partially what we're here to do. And then I also just want to draw an analogy, you know, if you think about the trajectory that our dairy farms have undergone, um, the commoditization of dairy has really not worked in Vermont. We are a state that produces high quality products on a smaller scale that don't really compete um, in a commodity marketplace. And if we set up a cannabis industry that is based on that same commodity model, you know, it's not going to lead to a multitude of thriving Vermont businesses. I mean, just look at the really devastating number of businesses that have gone out of business um, in the dairy industry. And now, and I know there have been many iterations over the years, some of which your committee members have led of trying to create a Vermont brand that is based on quality and sort of a craft um, angle within the dairy industry. And I think we have a real opportunity here with cannabis to do that now from the ground floor versus letting this play out. Um, maybe as Sean was referring to in Oregon where it takes five or 10 years for that for that model to emerge. So I think that's really what we're trying to accomplish is, you know, not, we know we can't make it perfect, but let's get it as close as we can and support craft producers as much as we can right now. Um, yeah. so that we don't just set up the same, you know, failing commodity system that we have <clears throat> in other areas of our ag economy. Uh, yep. that's all. Thank you, Maddie. Um, any other comments in regards to uh, this subject before we move on to our next uh, witness? I don't see any hands, so 
Who's up next, uh, Caroline? So, so next we'll have Stephen Leslie uh, speak to the committee and, and um, him and also Kat both have been here at the last Small Farm Action Day as well, but um, you know, both are um, activists themselves. So the, I think the message they bring to the committees are just, uh, you know, to be expand, expanded on. So um, uh, St Steve will go a little deeper to, uh, in, into um, his, his vision of a um, Soil Health Restoration Act, and I'm excited for this presentation to come. So Stephen, um, kick it off. Thank you. Morning, Steve. Morning Chairman Starr. Chairman, good uh, Chairman good to have you with us. Um, yeah, thanks for hosting farmers here today. Uh, as Carolyn said, you might remember me from the last small farm action days when I spoke to you about soil health management systems. Today, I'd like to talk about the broader context that has brought soil health to the forefront and why I believe the next biennium of the legislature should pass a Vermont Healthy Soil Protection and Restoration Act. And I want to back up a little bit by just looking at, you know, like for any generation, it's, it's difficult to imagine that the world of the past was so radically different than the present. So like here in Vermont with our rolling farm fields and forested mountains, the land appears so healthy. Uh, and you know, the Northeast region has this built-in resilience of abundant, abundant precipitation and this temperate climate. And the land has recovered to such a degree that unless you study our land use history, it's, it's not evident that European settlement brought about really the uh, near ecological collapse to this region. Uh, uh, you know, contrary to popular myth, uh, New England was not a place of poor, thin, and rocky soils. The deciduous and evergreen forests that uh, blanketed the hills and basins of our region were a species of or organism that co evolved over 12,000 years since the, the last glaciers uh, moved out. And uh, all the tons of carbon that were held in the trunks and branches uh, were dwarfed by the real long term stable carbon. It was built up over those centuries in a substrata of deep humus. And that's the carbon bank that we farmers are still drawing on today in those ancient old growth forests. You know, when the Europeans arrived here, uh, the way, the, they thought it was a wilderness. And we know that now that there were tens of thousands of Western Abenaki people living here and they saw that forest as food forest. The thought of taking that forest down would have been just complete, complete insanity to them. And an Abenaki person alive, a Benaki person alive in 1850 would have seen their world completely undone. And so I think it's, you know, for me as a farmer, I started out, I'm, I'm a kid from the suburbs of Southern New Hampshire and I didn't actually become a farmer apprentice until I was 30 years old, 30 years ago. Um, so I've had, needless to say, this incredible, long, uh, wonderful, hard learning curve uh, uh, to make my living as a farmer. Uh, and uh, when we landed on this property here in Heartland, uh, 200 acres, 270 acres uh, um, in 1999, um, it had been, uh, you know, your typical uh, milking 110 uh, Holsteins, you know, making silage and hay all over town on uh, properties and um, set stocking the cattle out on the 50 acres of pasture every night on the same 50 acres. Uh, just, uh, and, uh, you know, really good, hardworking Vermonters, uh, but um, uh, just caught up in that kind of uh, treadmill of, of the commodity dairy cycle that Maddie was just referencing and uh, eventually had to sell out. And when we inherited the place, uh, uh, it was pretty beat up. It, you know, probably continuously farmed for 200 years. Uh, the uh, uh, cornfields, you know, uh, in corn year after year with atrazine, and PK being applied, uh, and a lot of manure, because uh, back then you could put raw manure out on the fields all winter long. Uh, so particularly the fields closest to the barn were quite, uh, you know, relatively good organic matter, but nonetheless, pretty beat up land. And I guess as a, uh, as a young farmer, I really didn't understand the extent to which our land had been degraded. Like if what, if what had been done in Vermont, when it was done in other parts of the country that are more brittle, as we say, uh, desertification has occurred. You know, they talk about parts of the American Southwest where the Spanish explorers were riding through on horses in grass up to their shoulders on horseback. And those places now are desert. Um, and, you know, uh, what I 
understand there is what we have in Vermont is this incredible opportunity for restoration. Uh, but I think we need to understand first uh, just how incredibly degraded our environment is compared to what was once here. When I was a student at Goddard College back in 1980, I got a chance to go to uh, Lord's Hill in um, Marshfield, which is one of the last remaining stands of old growth in the forest. I think there's like less than 1% of our, our woods are still truly old growth. And um, it was uh, a revelatory experience for me uh, at that to see these trees with nine foot diameter uh, uh, crowns, just enormous 150, 200 foot high crowns. Uh, anywhere where a tree had fallen, there was this whole understory of uh, regeneration and uh, varied habitat. And the thing is that these forests were very complex. They, they were dynamic. They weren't in some kind of static state. Uh, they were continually evolving and, 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 and because of that kind of disturbance of one giant tree going down, they were this very varied and highly diverse, biodiverse uh, environment. And, um, uh, you know, and, and now, you know, I think of like a 60 acre cornfield that uh, we have removed all of that incredible biomass from, right? We've reduced it to bare soil. And then we uh, get this GMO fungicide treated corn seed and we plant that 60 acres to that single crop. Uh, we put, we inject raw liquid manure into it. We put atrazine, uh, perhaps glyphosate on it. Uh, um, we put NPK pelleted chemical soluble fertilizers on it. And, uh, and we let it grow for four or five months. And then we come in and we remove that biomass for silage. Then maybe we put in a, a rye cover crop for five months. Uh, and in the springtime, we'll come in with a 150 horsepower tractor and a disc to, and, and turn it all up again. And because we've done that cover cropping, we're gonna pat ourselves on the back and call it regenerative. Well, it's a step in the right direction, right? But it's a tiny step. We can do so much better, so much more. If you think about that field and you think about taking that old growth forest, holding it as our measure of what uh, could be what once was and, and where we need to try to get back to in terms of soil health. And, um, you know, with the, the thing with soil health is we talk a lot about carbon sequestration, but uh, I think here in Vermont, it's really evident after uh, Tropical Storm Irene that what we're also, and of course, with uh, the health of our lakes and Lake Champlain, what we're also, of course, talking about is water quality. And, you know, so as the globe is heating up, more and more water in the water cycle is being held in the atmosphere as water vapor, up to 90% of, uh, of uh, the atmosphere is water vapor, whereas like 0.0.4%, 0.4% is carbon dioxide, still way too much at this point, but it's, uh, it's a fraction. And it's that water vapor that's driving all these hydrologic events of hurricanes, wildfires, uh, rising sea levels, mega precipitation events, uh, flash droughts in Vermont, um, and one gram of uh, soil carbon can hold eight grams of water. So when we, and, and you've probably heard these figures from NRCS, one uh, percent increase of soil organic matter in an acre of agricultural field will hold 20 to 27,000 uh, gallons of water. I mean, it's an, an incredible ability to infiltrate and hold that uh, a truly healthy soil has. But how do we get there? So like, all right, and I know I, uh, Somebody wave it when I need to be quiet. But um, so I started out, um, as I said, a small diversified organic farmer uh, with my wife, Carrie. We milk 24 cows, have about 70 total head. We raise beef animals. We do a CSA. Uh, we're diversified. We make hay. Um, and, uh, you know, we worked off farm jobs. We started farming in 1992 as apprentices. We worked off farm jobs until 2009. Uh, we've always paid our employees Vermont minimum wage or more. We haven't done the apprentice route. Uh, and we've always ended up paying our employees more than we pay ourselves. There's a lot of times where we qualified for food stamps and just because we had food, we, we didn't capitalize on that. We went uninsured uh, until Obamacare came along. Uh, you know, and it's not that we're bad managers because we could think that, but we look around, we talk with other farmers, we look at the national statistics. I think I quoted you last Find that in 2019, the average farm family in the United States made negative $1,200. So um, for farmers then to, uh, like us, 
we, our goal has always been to farm for healthy soil first. Now it's, we're learning and learning all the time what that actually means, but um, uh, you know, most, but even the commodity farmers that are farming for yield and efficiency, they're not doing any better and in some cases worse. You know, we know all how, how much debt it takes to run a dairy farm. So my point being that if we're gonna attract new and young farmers like to uh, uh, BTC and, and, and really uh, not just have the hype about our local food economy, but actually have a local food economy, uh, um, we need to make this uh, a living that, you know. Farmers need to make a, a livable wage. And it seems to me that when we talk about payment for ecological services, uh, we really need to be talking about kind of a, a base universal income for farmers who are willing to adopt uh, soil health uh, management systems, uh, working very closely with uh, uh, farmer to farmer training and um, uh, the best science and, and uh, best innovation. But, um, uh, you know, so the payment for ecological services just can't be uh, based on uh, quantification of, oh, there's so much carbon being stored, but rather these, this farm is adopting this whole raft of practices for their specific context, you know, including what crops they're gonna grow because of what the social context is where they are and, and uh, all of those other larger ramifications. Uh, so um, if we were to um, pass a soil health uh, Protection, Healthy Soil Protection and Restoration Act here in the state of Vermont, we could then make it statutory that soil itself is protected. And I think that's the, the critical thing. That, the main point I wanted to bring to you today that, you know, in 1972, we passed the Clean Air and Clean Water Act. The EPA was established under the Nixon administration. Um, and we didn't pass a soil protection act at that point because we didn't have the ecological understanding that we can't have clean air and clean water without healthy soil, yeah. right? And so we put the cart before the horse with the best of intentions, but I think the time is now where we need to recognize that without healthy soil, we don't have, it is the only true wealth we as human beings and as incarnated uh, species have here and we're losing it. We're, the, the FAO of the UN has given us about 60 harvests left worldwide um, you know, we say we have three to 4% organic matter in our commodity farms, in the state of Vermont at best, but, and that sounds great compared to the 1% or less nationally, but it's still, we're still losing topsoil with our current farming practices. And as an organic farmer, I didn't understand that photosynthesis itself is what draws carbon, and, uh, the, creates the liquid carbon pathway that feeds uh, the soil microbiome, and that's what actually builds soil. I, I was also in this whole input idea, I've got to put more compost, I've got to keep putting all my cover crops, I do need to do those things, and I need to learn how to minimize uh, disturbance, maximize photosynthesis, and it's that minimize, dis minimize disturbance part that isn't just no-till or reduced tillage, it's also uh, not overgrazing, not uh, putting the same crop year after year, not putting chemical disturbance that uh, acts as biocides. So um, there's, uh, I, I'll, I'll try to wrap up. Thank you so much for your time and for listening. And um, uh, the, yeah, just, just if I could just um, finish with this last little statement. So the roots of all social injustice are bound up with the exploitation of land, water, and air the colonial capitalist system that historically and currently inflicts so much cruelty upon poor indigenous people of color and small farmers everywhere is the same system that exploits and degrades the natural world. Reparations to one without the other will be meaningless. Progressive soil health policy can be a first step to reestablishing the commons, recognizing the rights of all, living, of all living beings. Climate scientists the world over have declared that the transition to organic regenerative land management and habitat restoration must begin now in order to stave off the worst effects of abrupt climate change and loss of biodiversity. Soil health protection and restoration is our less, last best chance to pass on a livable planet to the next generation. We need to elevate healthy soil as the essential ingredient to solving the climate and ecological crisis. Soil is such a critical resource that we can no longer leave its management unregulated. Ownership or leasehold or any other form of land tenure can no longer mean free license to degenerate or uh, destroy soil. Government must protect this resource and offer transformational incentives 
for the adoption of main and maintenance of soil health management systems. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. And I think maybe since our last meeting, um, we, <clears throat> we have in the legislature uh, awarded um, Ryan Patch a couple hundred thousand dollars to get his ecosystem soil health program uh, started at the agency. And I don't know if you're uh, on any of, of those committees at the agency in regards to uh, proper soil protections and soil health, but uh, <clears throat> Ryan and and the committee, you know, our Senate committee uh, heard the importance of soil health and and proper soil ingredients. Uh, well, this earlier before this meeting, we talked about inputs and and who should be looking after those inputs and regulating them uh, to make our soils stronger and better and, and healthier. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're headed in the right direction. It's just slow moving. And I don't know if other committee members have uh, questions or concerns uh, <clears throat> that they want to raise, but we, we did put that uh, allotment of funds in that early bill that uh, we passed. And so that crew at the agency should be firing up and, and getting going on that right away uh, because we have approved the, the resources to, to move that forward. Maddie, did you have a question or, yep. Um, not a question, but I just wanted to share an update with you all in case you in case folks don't know that the PES working group has started meeting again and we had our first meeting um, in just about a year actually last month and we'll have our next meeting, I believe this Thursday. Um, yeah, tomorrow. So we have started up again and I think um, Stephen's points are really well taken, you know, about just the context of that conversation being, you know, really taking a holistic look. Somebody put it in a meeting the other day that I was in that um, there are no regenerative practices, only regenerative systems. Um, and I think that that is a, a good way to sort of sum up a lot of what Stephen is referring to in terms of where we should be moving with these kinds of policies. Um, so just like <clears throat> well, that's good that you're, so you're already started uh, meeting them. That's great. Uh, did we have another witness, um, Caroline? Yeah. Last but not least will be uh, Kat Buxton speaking with us. And actually Kat is um, uh, not just uh, representing the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, but is actually also a working group member of this PES and Soil Health Working Group. So take it away, Kat. Oh, good morning, Kat, and welcome. Good morning, good morning, Chairman Starr and Chairman Partridge. Thank you all for um, being here to listen to farmers and farm advocates. Uh, this is a really critical part of our government process and I'm really, um, really grateful for you all to make time to listen to us and to NOFA and Rural Vermont for organizing these important events. Um, it's also been really nice to hear the testimony from others coming in today. Um, I will just mention on the cannabis um, conversation. This isn't, I'm, I'm going to be talking about compost, but I, I, one thing I didn't hear, and I know this may not be um, in the agricultural committee's realm, but I, I certainly hope that as we move forward with cannabis legislation that we don't forget about home gardeners um, and our right to grow food and medicine for ourselves, um, uh, avoiding industry, just like we have always done um, in our agricultural heritage. So um, please let's make sure that we take care of uh, the Vermont people um, who grow food and medicine for themselves. Um, what I really would like to talk about today is composting. Um, so uh, Caroline mentioned I am the uh, co-chair of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, the co-founder of that organization. I also run a business called Grow More Waste Less where I uh, do education throughout the state around composting, soil health, um, and I work with elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and adults um, running compost systems at schools, 
I work with the Composting Association of Vermont and Farm to Plate working to produce an on-farm composting toolkit to help us manage our local nutrients in the state of Vermont. Um, I work a lot with farmers on site who need technical assistance to understand the processes of composting so that they can produce healthy soil like Stephen was talking about. Um, so the way we compost does matter in terms of the outcomes of those products. Um, I also am finding that farmers need technical assistance in an ongoing way and so do homeowners and towns and municipalities when it comes to composting. Um, it can be done very badly. It's a very simple process that our grandparents and their grandparents knew, <laughs> um, but we don't, we've, we've lost so much in just a few generations. And when we talk about healthy soil and the need to regenerate healthy soil in Vermont um, to mitigate climate change, to adapt and transform, to build our healthy soils, to build the water holding capacity in our soils, it's really important that we optimize the local nutrients that we are producing as waste products and turn those into healthy soil builders. And the way to do that is through proper composting. The state, as we all know, uh, we have our universal recycling law, which has mandated that everyone needs to be removing organic matter from the landfill. Um, and that is happening to varying degrees. I get calls almost every week from individuals, from housing complexes, from municipalities and towns that are trying to figure out how to best manage their organics without jeopardizing our wildlife, um, which is critically important as we continue to fragment our landscapes in Vermont. We are jeopardizing all of the wildlife that lives here and right now when bears are active, if we don't manage our compost well, we are jeopardizing their lives as well as the citizens of the state and our water quality, of course. So what I would like to ask to get to my point is that as the agricultural committee, if we could please invest in the technical assistance that we need to be able to make sure that our universal recycling law can be met that we are optimizing our local nutrients and investing them back into the bank of soil for future generations. And if you could please ask the Agency of Natural Resources and the Department of Agriculture to please work together in a holistic fashion to manage our nutrients to help our farming communities and our residential communities invest in our soil um, these two agencies have not been working very well together um, and it's really causing some problems um, in terms of how people are being able to meet this very basic requirement, which I think is a good one. I'm also very concerned to see the rise of depacking plants and shipping our nutrients out of state and mixing them with plastics. It also concerns me that we um, may not be thinking of chickens as a very helpful tool in managing food scraps and building soil on farms. Um, so I would like to offer uh, ongoing um, discussion with any of you who would, may have more questions. I do have a view of sort of the whole state from a pretty unique perspective as an educator and a farmer technical advisor and soil health consultant. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And I hope that you will consider all you can do to advance composting holistically and soil health holistically in our state. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Kat. And I think we, we just got done a, a very strenuous uh, discussion on composting and and uh, we, I think we've been fighting for about two or three years on, uh, we call it the chicken bill, where uh, farmers wanted to pick up uh, uh, waste and take it to their farm and create a, a uh, feeding the chickens and making compost. And uh, we, we have gotten that passed. Uh, I don't know if that's over on the house side now, the chicken bill. And we're uh, Bobby, we're about to uh, we're about to vote it out in the next few days. Yeah. And um, so it uh, but it's been a long, hard battle. Um, I I don't know if if the house has had this. Bobby, 
Bobby, I think you're frozen. Well, maybe I'll take the liberty of jumping in and ask Kat, have you been able to check out that bill? I'm S-102 maybe. Um, and, and had any input or are there things we missed in there? But what we were trying to do was a lot of what you're talking about is, is make it easier for farmers to set up small compost operations, make it very explicit that farmers that were feeding chickens um, through with food scraps were, were able to do that, continue doing that in per perpetuity. And in fact, to get the agency of ag engaged uh, as you're suggesting. So I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that, but we have spent a bunch of time, uh, particularly in Senate Ag and now on the House Ag, working on just that. Thank you, Senator Pearson, for bringing that up. Yes, I'm familiar with the bill, and um, I also sit on the Rural Vermont board, so I am pretty familiar with the policies that Rural Vermont um, advocates for, and I'm, I'm a big fan of that bill, and I thank you all for your ongoing work on that. I do think it's a really important step, um, and just one step I'd like to see in the agencies working well together toward that holistic view of composting, soil health, and uh, managing our universal recycling law. Thank you. Is Bobby back with us or not? He's not here. Okay. Um, yeah, Kat, we are about to um, we're about to vote that out. There was some uh, consideration to adding some other things to it. Um, we are working on the second part of the bill, which has to do with registering animal health supplements, and um, that will require a fee. And so I'm working on that aspect of it uh, with ways and means, sort of as we speak. Um, and so. My, I anticipate that we're going to vote that out in the next um, day or two and that it will then go to Ways and Means. But I, I think everybody recognizes how important um, the, that, that aspect of, of composting is to um, all sorts of folks. It's a, it's, you know, a multiple win if we can, uh, we can create a good situation for them. Um, so I'm wondering if there are any other questions or folks who would like to testify, Caroline or Maddie. Kat, you want to go ahead? Could I just follow up? Um, just, just one more thing. Uh, thank you again for uh, responding to the, the chicken and egg or the chicken bill um, part that is a really <laughs> significant piece. Um, but I do also want to just advocate for um, you know, the state passed the universal re recycling law, which I think was a really good move, but we did so without any enforcement or funding. Um, and as I mentioned, I get calls from people all the time. And a lot of what people are wondering is, where can I get money to uh, build the facility I need to be able to manage my compost well, to protect wildlife and, and to manage soil health? And so if there's any way that we can take some of this uh, $4 billion coming in from the feds to invest into the proper facilities to protect our wildlife and, and make sure that our farmers have what they need and our land managers to manage these nutrients. I think that would go a long way into the investment of soil health in Vermont. And, and Kat, what do you envision when you, when you say an investment? What, what do you think people would like to um, invest in? I think that um, oftentimes people would like to invest in say a concrete pad that is covered. So a, a space where you can, um, you can manage your compost and you can manage the water and um, who comes in and out of it. So that's certainly what I'm seeing on farms and many farms need to do this to be able to comply with the wraps um, and also to be able to work with entrepreneurs that are say collecting food scraps to bring them onto their farm. I work with one particular um, a set of people in the Upper Valley. We have Willow Tree Community Compost, a new entrepreneur picking up food scraps from area residents in the five boroughs or the five villages of Hartford and bringing them to Sunrise Farm. Uh, they were able to get some money through a working lands grant and a local crowdfunding campaign to build a composting facility 
uh, that they also put solar panels up on top of the roof to maximize the energy collected. So funding like that, um, those were some savvy people that also were working with me um, and we were able to somehow get them funding, but it was really difficult to do. So that kind of funding for facilities, uh, concrete pad, maybe aerated static composting to be able to speed up uh, uh, roofing structure and then ongoing technical expertise uh, assistance is is really critical as these farmers are learning they need somebody to come in you know every three to six months to just sort of check and make sure that they're doing things right great thank you um maddie your hand is up do you want to go ahead yeah i just am like i'm thrilled by your comments kat um and i and i just want to tack on to them that i think an analogous um, situation exists on dairy farms where we could really use some targeted support for dairies to manage manure in alternative ways um, to digesters, which could include composting, you know, similarly to what Kat's talking about, um, bedded packs, things like that, that are really, I think, largely popular among organic dairy farms at this point, but could be widely applicable um, and very similar to what Kat is talking about. These practices have huge benefits for water quality, for you know, animal health in some cases, for soil health. Um, and I think similarly, a really targeted investment from the state to support um, dairy farmers who want to transition or start those kinds of practices along with um, really robust technical assistance because there is definitely a learning curve to transitioning to those practices um, would be really exciting to see in the, in the dairy community. Thanks, Maddie. Um, I just got a chat message from from our assistant Linda that uh, Bobby is probably he's looking for a connection, but he's having a hard time. All the more reason for more broadband. Um, we have about two minutes left. Uh, are there is does anyone else want to testify? Does anyone else want to have um, to uh, do you have questions, John? Your hands up. Go ahead. I just wondered, thinking about what Stephen said too, it, as far as building soil, do, does your average Vermont forest or la open land that's left alone actually build soil better than a lot of, you know, once, once there's sort of humor, human interaction with it, whether it's farm or event. And so, right, most of our focus has to be on watching what we do. Does that make sense? I think so. You broke up a, a little bit there. Was that question for me, John, or for Stephen? Yeah, either one. Um, oh, I'll, go, I'll go first, and I'll just say that, um, yes, humans certainly impact the landscape. Um, but I, I think maybe what you were suggesting is if we leave lo a land alone, will it, will it regenerate on its own? And, and the answer is not necessarily in the way that it was. So we've, we've really taken a lot out. Um, as Stephen talked about uh, historically. And we now understand a lot more. In fact, we're learning every day more about the soil microbiome and how to, um, how to communicate and understand what's happening down there in the soil. It's really dynamic. Um, so there are many things that we can do on our managed landscapes, <laughs> managed or whether they're managed well or not, um, to increase um, soil health uh, and, and increase the uh, ability for plants to photosynthesize. So maximizing biomass, species diversity, um, changing the way that we graze animals using holistic grazing management, et cetera. I could go on and on, but I don't think that's what you're looking for. So I'll stop there. And then Stephen, do you want to add? Sure, just, just quickly, I'd say, uh, so I came across a, a, a figure, John, from a, uh, Ethan Tapper, who's a Chittenden County forester, who's uh, done a, does a lot with uh, ecological forestry uh, teaching in the state. He's a great resource. Um, but he, um, Ethan quoted uh, that forest ecologists estimate that if you let a New England farm field go fallow, it will take about 120 years of forest succession to reestablish something approaching a healthy uh, soil biome. And in part because of what Kat described, um, you know, over the last 25 years, we've learned so much about the uh, role of mycorrhizal and saprophytic fungi as kind of like the keystone species of soil health. And, and when those are wiped out, that's a big part of what takes a long time to reestablish. But with organic regenerative practices, 
we can speed up that process by at least 10 times. We can build as much as a t an inch of topsoil in a year uh, with management intensive practices. But of course, that's not on really large acreage that it requires, it is more management intensive and more labor intensive to work in that way. Now, if we have a, uh, a healthy uh, economy supporting a local regional food system, then that's opportunity for more people to be involved with uh, regenerative agriculture. So it's not necessarily a problem that it requires more people. Our trend over the last 120 years has been to remove people and replace them with machinery on the farm. I think we're talking about taking some steps back to a, a more of a, a middle ground where we have more management intensive human centered agriculture uh, <laughs> and happily so. I see that Bobby is back. Good for you, yeah. Bob. Yeah, I finally got, I had to change devices. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, it pays to have two or three or four computer systems, I guess, around. Um, so anyways, uh, it sounds like the soil health and healthy soils has uh, uh, picked up uh, some good discussion. Uh, are there others uh, or any other discussion on, uh, it is on my watch at 12, a little after 12 noon. Um, so I didn't know if there was any last minute comments from Caroline or Maddie. Um, yeah, maybe just really to um, reiterate that we are extremely grateful for your time this, this late in the session and that, that we could, that you, offer to facilitate this as another joint hearing, um, uh, just to be clear, otherwise it would have not come to any sort of forum, meet and greet with legislators due to the busy schedules of, of you all. So I th this was really the, the one and only way that we could have such a facilitated co conversation with farmers on, on various subjects, uh, whether they're currently in or not in legislation. So thank, thank you all, um, both sides, farmers and legislators, again, for making the time. Uh, and I hope that this has led to some common understanding on where some of these items stand in legislature currently, and also just um, from the farmer side, uh, clear appeals to, to move these, these, all these issues forward from a legislative perspective. So um, thank you all for being here today. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, uh, Caroline. Maddie, do you have any closing statements? Basically just the same as Caroline. Thank you so much for your time, everybody, farmers and legislators alike. We really appreciate it. And this was a great conversation. Thanks so much. Yeah, and on behalf of the legislators, I want to thank all you uh, folks for coming on and spending time with us. And uh, hopefully, uh, I don't know if we'll make another one this year like this, but hopefully next year, if we get, well, if we get back to Montpelier, I'd like to have this same type of setup set up so you guys don't have to all drive for an hour or two to get to Montpelier uh, mm -hmm. unless you feel comfortable and have the time, but yeah, we can meet and, and hear your concerns and you can hear a little bit from us on how what and how we're doing and and uh, it works very good this way um, to have a meeting this large and not for you folks not to have to drive for an hour or two to get to see us so and if, that, if there's a way we can arrange it for a rainy day next year i'm sure that would be appreciated by the farmers <laughs> <laughs> well you you pick that day. I don't want to get saddled with picking the wrong day. <laughs> no, um, yeah, it would be very helpful if you we can pick uh, pick our days. So, so thank you all very much. I uh, appreciate your comments and advice and direction, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully uh, stay in touch through Maddie and. Caroline and uh, we'll uh